May the words of my heart, words of my mouth, the inspiration of my heart be to your service, O oh God. Amen. So, I really love the lectionary and the discipline foisted upon a Lutheran preacher to follow the lectionary, to preach the word first, middle, and last. That's the job. But sometimes the lectioners blow it. The lectioners, the people who put it together, and it's changing over time. And this is a really good example of them having blown it. So that's why I burdened you with that long story. And notice I didn't, I did not go all the way back to read the, 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 the Herod's Feast, the beheading of John for you. I just reminded of you of it. Because the truth of the matter is, you have to read that whole segment from the banquet that Herod holds through to the passage that we ended with, Jesus healing the destitute who come so eagerly and willingly to touch his cloak. You have to read that whole thing as one in order to hear the word. So the lectioners accidentally hindered the, pre the preacher today. Well, the preacher decided to fix it. <laughs> so Thank you. let's kind of rehearse this again. Let's go back to Herod's banquet. So you remember this from last week, if you were here, those of you who weren't or don't remember it, um, Herod throws a banquet, invites the wealthy, the powerful, the elite, and he invites Herodias' daughter to dance, and they're happy. Now understand, when somebody has a big party like this, it's called a symposium, People recline, they eat sumptuous food, they drink great drinks, they see great entertainment, in this case, the dancer. And it's all for the sake of the person who invites them there, in this case, Herod, to ensure that the power and the honor that he already has is clear to his audience. And inasmuch as they see this, they understand that he is their patron and they are his clients. And so they go away more beholden to him than they were before. There's an ulterior motive in this. So, and we didn't stress this last week, so let me stress it this week. When he, remember he likes John the Baptist, he's interested in John the Baptist. He's curious about what he has to say. So when he says to the dancer, whatever you want, I'll give it to you, and she says for her mother, give me John's head on a platter, he's disturbed. And this is what it says. And he was, he became very perilupos. Lupus? Pain, right? Lupus? So, somebody might have lupus, it's just the word for pain. Peri lupus, he became consumed with pain, okay? He became consumed with pain um, on account of his oath and his guests because he didn't want to refuse her. Now, you all understand this, right? He didn't want to refuse her because he has them all gathered there to acquire more honor for himself. He's showing them what a great guy he is. And if he were to say no, having made an oath, he would defeat the whole purpose of having that great banquet. He would look like a dishonorable fellow who goes back on his oaths, who doesn't do what he promised, and he would lose the benefit of the banquet. So, honor preserved, check. John's head on a platter, check. So understand that. Banquets, they're all about acquiring honor for the person who throws the banquet. So much for the death of John the Baptist. And then we get this feeding of the 5,000. You ever catch this, right? Two banquets, back to back. Two very different banquets. Now Jesus goes and he encounters these people who are destitute. Now understand, people who are wandering around in the countryside on this occasion are not people who own their own land. These are day laborers at best. These are people who can barely make ends meet. And the fact that they're wandering about 
um, means that this has not been a good day of work for them. And when he sees them, he is moved internally. There's this great Greek verb, splunknidzo, and it means sort of, you know that, you know, it, when you see somebody for whom you just intuitively have compassion, and it sort of rises up inside of you, that's what this is. He sees them and he decides, okay, I'll teach them. And so he begins to teach them. And his disciples come to him. You heard this. They come to him and they say, the hour's late. Um, you need to send these people away. They need to go get something to eat. They need to buy some food for themselves in the local villages and in the local farms. That's nonsense. Right? After all, these folks are wandering around having not worked that day. They're dependent on that day's wages, which would be about a denarius if they had work to feed themselves. So the disciples, they're not interested in holding a banquet for these folks. They say, let them take care of themselves. But remember, Jesus was moved internally. He sees these people and he says, well, let's feed them ourselves. And the disciples' response is, you want us to go and spend 200 denarii. Remember that 200 days worth of work $40,000, $50,000 for the bread to feed these people? And Jesus' response is, well, how much do you have between you? Five loaves, two fish. Let's take it. Let me bless it. Let me give it to them. And by the end, of course, we know the story. The people are fed. And there's food left over. So much for that story. And you see the contrast, right? One banquet where the guy who throws the banquet is all about acquiring honor for himself. <clears throat> Another banquet where someone just gives it away. Just throws it away. So that the hungry may be fed. And next, of course, comes the walking on the water. And you saw it on the screen. Um, he sends the disciples on ahead. He retreats after excusing the people. He retreats to pray and to think. He sees the disciples in trouble. He walks across the water. They're terrified. They're confused. And he says, don't be afraid. I am. He announces it to them. He makes it clear. Now you know who I am. I'm not Jesus. I am God incarnate. Here I am walking across the water. Only God can control nature. Did you catch the weird moment in this story, though, and their response? I'm just curious. Anybody? What's their response? They welcome into the boat, um, but they don't get it, right? They don't understand, but what is it they don't understand? This is crazy, right? Anybody catch this? <laughs> they don't understand about the loaves. They don't understand about the bread. <laughs> As a reader, as a listener, well, we should sort of feel that whiplash, right? They just saw God walking on the water. God just got into the boat with them, and they're still stuck on the bread. Like, what's going on with you guys? Well, you know what's going on with them. They don't understand the bread because they're living in that world of honor and shame. God just appeared in front of them and they say, yeah, 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 fine, 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 fine. But what about that crazy moment where you, the banquet giver, didn't acquire honor for yourself. You just gave it away. This is nuts. That's not the way the world works. They were confused about the bread. And then we get the contrast. They get to the shore, they moor, and people, the destitute, the sick, the afflicted, the possessed, the people with no honor to give, no chance to gather it to themselves, 
they have arrived ahead of time because they know where this guy is going to land and they want to touch his cloak. That's all. And believing they are healed and healed they believe. Having faith they are saved. Being saved they have faith. So what do we make of this? It's kind of clear, isn't it? As always in the Gospel of Mark, the disciples are the insiders who know the truth. They understand it's been revealed to them. God has said to them through Jesus Christ, I come and I save you free of charge. You can do nothing to earn your salvation. There's nothing you can do. In fact, the moment you try to do something, you separate yourself from me. So just take the gift when it comes. And the disciples, they get it and they say, no oh, thanks. Not interested. You say you're God? All we can think about is the fact that you just gave away all that bread and didn't get anything in return. That's the way the world works, right, Jesus? Well, you're crazy. And Jesus says, yep, I am. Hmm. So what do we do with this? You know, the temptation, I think, is for us to think, well, we're the insiders, right? <clears throat> After all, we're here on Sunday morning to hear the word, to be reminded of the water, to taste the bread and wine. We're the insiders, and so we're probably just too smug, right? And so we should sort of beat ourselves over the back a bit and make sure that we remember we are destitute, that we're like the sick and the possessed, and then we'll be ready to receive God's gift, right? you know how wrong that reading is, don't you? Because the minute we do that, guess what we just did? We became like the disciples, thinking, you don't give it away. We got to earn it. They got to earn it. So I got to be destitute. But you notice how the outsiders, by contrast, are? These are people who have nothing. These are people who have no honor to use to acquire more. They simply have to have faith. Their obedience leads to faith. Their faith leads to obedience. So in fact, I don't think this story or the Gospel of Mark at all is an exhortation to us. It's just a description of us because we need to be described by God's word over and over and over again. That's the preacher's job. Over and over and over again to describe to you what God does to us. Whether we like it or not, we are both insiders and outsiders, saints and sinners, believers, unbelievers, doers, not doers. And thanks be to God, <laughs> Jesus, the great I am, walks across the water to us and initiates us into a community of faith in baptism, comes to us in bread and wine, and renews us in this life, addresses us with the word of Scripture, and calls us to be who we are, saints and sinners, believers and obedient, obedient believers. God's people by God's will. Amen.